Taiwan has a progressive society in which democracy thrives, ensuring freedoms in education, economics and politics. The rights of its citizens are rigorously safeguarded, both through legal frameworks and in practical application, upholding a robust judicial system. Nevertheless, there are occasions when these rights are called into question and are challenged. It was just like any other day for 44-year-old Chen Longqi when he happened to visit a friend at a building at around 1 a.m. Chen recounted that on the night of the incident, there was another person involved who Chen doesn't know. That person had also come to meet Chen's friend. Chen coincidentally happened to be there and took a seat for a while. Inside the room occupied by him, his friend and the unfamiliar man, a woman entered unexpectedly. Chen swiftly expressed his discomfort with the situation and opted to depart, explaining that he needed to pick up his wife, who was just finishing work. He said that his wife finished work around 4 a.m., but he left to pick her up around 3 a.m. The following morning, amidst a state of confusion and shock, Chen received a summons from the police. He was to become the subject of an investigation and was ultimately charged with participating in the alleged rape of the woman. Throughout the course of the trial, in the courts of first instance, courts of appeal and the Supreme Court, Chen consistently denied any involvement in the wrongful act. Both male suspects at the scene confessed to raping the victim and defended Chen, asserting that he did not participate. Chen's wife also made a statement to the court as a witness. She asserted that Chen was with her at the time of the incident, so it's impossible for him to have been involved in the sexual assault. Chen told us that he immediately denied any involvement when the police accused him of being a co-offender. He also expressed doubts about the investigative process as there were witnesses corroborating his claim that he was not there at the scene at the time the crime was committed. The court did not, however, accord significant weight to the testimonies of personal acquaintances like Chen's wife and his friend, as they were considered biased in favor of the defendant. The victim was unconscious and unable to identify the perpetrator or perpetrators. The sole substantive evidence relied upon by the court to convict Chen and sentence him to four years in prison was the result of DNA analysis, which found a match between DNA found on the victim's underwear and Chen's DNA. While witnesses, circumstantial evidence or other material evidence can be unreliable, the use of DNA evidence to identify perpetrators in investigations is highly regarded for its accuracy, based on scientific principles. It's been instrumental in solving numerous cases. In the end, Chen decided to flee from the police after the court ruling. He sought assistance from organizations which help those who are wrongfully imprisoned. It's a rare occasion when the prosecutor in charge of a case requests a retrial when the case has reached its final judgment in the Supreme Court. After a two-year-long legal battle, though, Chen was finally acquitted. The pivotal evidence used to exonerate him was the same evidence that had initially implicated him – DNA results. How is that possible? DNA serves as a genetic code for the vast majority of living organisms on this planet, and it is structured as a double helix, resembling a right-handed curved staircase. What makes DNA remarkable is its high degree of uniqueness. It's exceedingly rare for two unrelated individuals to share the same DNA sequence. Minor genetic variations inevitably occur. The only exception to this rule are identical twins, who originate from the same fertilized egg and do share identical DNA. Each individual possesses a unique DNA profile, often referred to as a DNA fingerprint. This distinctive genetic pattern has been a vital tool used in forensic science to confirm the identity of individuals. While the term fingerprint is used metaphorically, it signifies the individualized nature of DNA profiles, 
There is no visual resemblance to traditional fingerprints, but it is unique in terms of genetic markers. Professor James Chung Lee, a forensic expert from the National University of Taiwan, is one of those who helped resolve this case. He told us that the initial DNA test was done in 2012. At that time, the Taiwanese evidence laboratories used a technique called Y-chromosome short tandem repeats, or YSTR, to compare 17 DNA loci. The results showed that the number of DNA loci found on the underwear of the victim and the DNA from Chen matched all 17 loci. This led to the conclusion that Chen could not be excluded as a suspect. When the case was reopened, however, a new DNA test was conducted using more advanced methodology, expanding the analysis from 17 loci to 23. This more detailed examination using the updated technology revealed discrepancies. The result of the recent DNA analysis revealed a disparity between the biological material discovered on the victim's undergarments and Chen's DNA sample, differing at two distinct genetic locations. This incongruity stood as the irrefutable evidence that would ultimately clear Chen of any wrongdoing, as the substance detected on the victim's underwear did not trace back to Chen. In the wake of these compelling findings, Chen's innocence was established beyond doubt. It's not just Chen's case. There are many others who believe that they've been wrongfully convicted, some even sentenced to death. One of the most heart-wrenching cases involves a soldier accused of raping a five-year-old girl. He was given the death sentence and executed. Years later, however, fresh evidence confirmed his innocence. The number of people who have been wrongfully accused and convicted for crimes they didn't commit is not known exactly. Yet, by looking at the number of case files stored in this room of accused people seeking assistance from organizations, we can infer that the number is significant and increasing every year. So this is the um, important room? Yes, or you, uh, this, uh, you can... It's 2016 and 2015. So this is for this year? Yes, uh, last year, 2016. Now it's seven. 200 cases? Uh, yes, about 209, 210, 211. So, uh, and it's 2015, also 200. So you told me that all the cases, which is in this room, is about 800, is uh, already final. They're either yeah. in detention center or in jail. Or yes, or, or maybe they are just get out, mm. get, get out from the prison, which they are free now, but they still claim they are innocent. The cases range from intentional and unintentional homicides to sexual assaults. Every case submitted has already received a final verdict from the Supreme Court. Typically, those who are innocent but judged guilty will tirelessly seek for ways to prove their innocence. This situation is particularly intense in Taiwan, as the death penalty still exists here. One of those facing the death sentence is Cheng Xinsei. He was accused of killing a police officer. He's been through three trials, all of which sentenced him to death. After spending 14 years in prison, in 2016, the prosecutor decided to reopen the case after evidence surfaced suggesting that he had been tortured into confessing. On the day of the incident, Cheng was at a bar with friends. A dispute erupted in a karaoke room. The police intervened, and amid the chaos, an officer was shot dead. While the position Cheng was in could not possibly have allowed him to shoot the officer, he confessed to the crime. Cheng's lawyer claims that his client is innocent, but was tortured into confessing while being interrogated by the police, without a lawyer present. He was electrocuted and beaten, causing him significant distress, duress under which he confessed. The lawyer said that inflicting physical harm on anyone in police custody is prohibited. The law clearly states that confessions obtained while under duress cannot be used as evidence in a legal case. In this case, the dead officer was a member of the organization investigating the case, so there could be an inclination to frame a suspect. 
Normally, if a suspect shows signs of physical abuse during interrogation, their confession holds less weight. In Cheng's case, despite clear evidence of torture, the court gave importance to his confession, which was given during both the police and prosecutor's interrogations. During the prosecutor's phase, even though Cheng was no longer being physically abused, he stuck to his confession. Cheng's lawyer says that those who've just been tortured might still feel immense pressure and wouldn't dare to speak out. When the prosecutor asked Chen if his confession was true, he was too scared to retract it. Cheng said that the prosecutor should check the gun, suggesting it would prove he wasn't the shooter. He was cautious in his statements, because the police were present during the interrogations. The case of Chen is Taiwan's first instance of DNA evidence alone being used to overturn a verdict. His case has triggered significant changes within Taiwan's justice system. The judicial process in Taiwan, spanning from initial police involvement to the final court proceedings, has been under increasing pressure to reform. There are growing calls for the evidence gathered on a case to be preserved, with a particular emphasis on DNA and its test results. This is driven by the recognition that, as technology continues to advance, DNA testing becomes increasingly accurate and indispensable in the pursuit of justice. Flaws in the justice system not only affect those sentenced, but also impact their families. In Chen's case, after the court sent him down for four years, he decided to flee with his wife and child. Chen told us that he didn't know how long his family would get to stay together. His restaurant business had been shut down. He had nothing and nowhere to go, not knowing when all this would end. He feared that a prison sentence would permanently separate him from his family, and his sole desire was to be with them. Chen and his family lived the life on the run in hiding for over two years. The life he'd built and the loved ones he cherished were devastated by a crime which has now been proved that he didn't commit. The restaurant business he'd built up with his own sweat and hard work crumbled. Employees and friends distanced themselves from him. Chen recounted that he felt lost, extremely distressed and clueless about what to do next. He told us that he had no sense of guilt because he knew he'd not done anything wrong. But being accused of a crime he didn't commit made him feel unjustifiably trapped by a system about which he could do nothing. When there were people who detected flaws in the evidence related to Chen's DNA analysis, combined with the open-mindedness of the prosecutor and the results from the preserved old tests, the truth was revealed. If you want to see more great content from all over the world, please like the video. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. The actions and demands that followed Chen's case were not meant to undermine the credibility of forensic science procedures, but to refine them, ensuring that DNA plays an increasingly indisputable role in the judicial process. After the heartbreaking case of the soldier who was wrongfully executed and Chen's case, many began to hope that the flaws in the justice system would be ironed out following changes in investigation procedures. The practice of torturing suspects is now more or less unheard of due to mandatory video recording. A new law also allows the accused to request a retest of the DNA evidence in their case. Reopening old, legally concluded cases can not only restore justice to the innocent, but it also reveals potential errors in the judicial process, such as flaws or mistakes in otherwise highly credible forensic evidence like DNA. This isn't the first time that an innocent person has been punished, and Taiwan isn't the only place where this happens. Many developed and developing countries have faced similar issues. For Chen Longqi, it is a miracle. Miracles don't, however, happen often or for everyone.